Hello and welcome to this introduction to evolution video. I'm Dr. Alad Roberts and in this video we're going to be looking at the timescales on which evolution occurs and how we can estimate speciation events based on an organism's molecular clock. Now a key question for evolutionary biologists is at what point does a population become a new species or a subspecies? Evolution by its definition is a process of natural selection that results in change over time and if enough time passes this will lead to diversification which can then result in speciation. And so there are two theoretical frameworks that describe the tempo of the speciation process. We have a punctuated model representing a relatively quick transition which is in contrast to the gradual model which represents a much slower transition period. So we'll take a look at these in more detail, starting with the punctuated model. This was first proposed in the 1970s and suggests that species remain in periods of stasis where they are very stable and resist change. Then at some point, this stability is punctuated by a short and rapid burst of significant evolutionary change resulting in a new species. So as an example, here we can see species A, which has been in stasis for a prolonged period of time. Then there is a period of rapid change, resulting in a new population, which is then different enough to the point it doesn't interbreed and therefore is given a new species name, species B. Then this new species and the original species go back to a period of prolonged stasis. Now the interesting thing about this model by far is that it challenges the traditional view that species evolve through a slow and steady accumulation of genetic changes. And instead, this change is the result of key genetic changes such as single nucleotide substitutions or single event errors that lead to catastrophic reproductive isolation that immediately separates a subpopulation from the main population. And finally we have the gradual model. This is what we think of when we think about evolution. A slow and gradual change in species that at some point results in a new species developing. This is less black and white compared to the punctuated model and is a grey scale as sometimes it can be very difficult to determine the time in which one species becomes another. So as an example, here we can see species A which is split into two subpopulations. One subpopulation continues to represent species A, but another accumulates small changes which eventually result in the emergence of species B. Now an important question here is when does species B start? Is it here? Is it here? Or is it here? Due to the gradual changes that accumulate, it can be extremely difficult to determine, even with well-preserved and extensive documented fossil records. Now this gradual change is commonly associated with multiple genetic, biological and morphological changes as a result of changes in the environment. And over time, this results in the formation of a reproductive barrier that strengthens to the point of reproductive isolation and the generation of a new species. Now we know this tempo can be fast or slow relating to our punctuated or gradual models, but just how long does it actually take? Well, evolutionary timescales are unlike normal timescales. As we have learned, they can be immediate in terms of our punctuated model or occur over many thousands or even millions of years relating to our gradual model. And as we've seen, when we have a gradual change, it can be quite difficult to delimit species and identify a cutoff point. And so if we think about human evolution, great apes acted as a common ancestor. And then through evolutionary history, there were various divergence events giving rise to humans and chimpanzees. Now the point in evolutionary history where we would have speciation and the divergence of these two species is difficult to determine. It could have happened early in our evolutionary history or it could have happened much later. Now this period of uncertainty is known as a grey zone where speciation might have started but was not complete leading to some level of interbreeding, some similar characteristics and some similar behaviours. Essentially, the grey zone is where two populations or lineages are in the process of undergoing speciation. Now a key question is how might we go about determining when two species diverge from one another? 
And so a common go-to piece of evidence are our fossil records, which can show evolutionary change during this grey zone, allowing us to suggest when speciation might have occurred. But what happens when there are no fossil records? How can we determine divergence that extends beyond the fossils we have recorded? Well, a species' evolutionary history is documented extremely well in its own genome. And so as our understanding of genomics and bioinformatics has increased, we are able to sequence the genomes of different species and look at changes in the genetic code between closely and distantly related species. And there is a theory that the more that time has passed since a speciation event and a divergence of two species, the more changes it will accumulate in its genome. And this essentially relates to a species molecular clock. We look at regions of the genome that have evolved at a set rate, and using James Hutton's theory of gradualism, we can trace changes back and estimate when two species diverge from one another. Now, our use of molecular clocks to determine divergence events is based on some very key assumptions. The first is that mutations in orthologous genes, so these are genes that originated from a common ancestor, are proportional to the amount of time that has passed since the species diverged from the common ancestor. Essentially, as more time passes, more mutations will accumulate, therefore more mutations means divergence occurred earlier in evolutionary history, whereas fewer mutations means divergence occurred relatively recently. Our other assumption is that mutations in paralogous genes, so these are genes that arise from a duplication event, are proportional to the amount of time that passed since the gene duplication. Essentially, as more time passes, mutations will accumulate differently in the two genes. Therefore, more mutations means divergence occurred earlier in evolutionary history, whereas fewer mutations means divergence occurred relatively recently. And so, in order to use a species genome as a molecular clock, there are a few important things we must account for. We need to make sure that when looking at mutations, we do so in genes that have a relatively stable and reliable mutation rate, allowing changes to be tracked back so that they can identify evolutionary branch points with common ancestors and predict speciation events. We can then compare genetic differences against our fossil records and make an informed decision as to when a speciation event might have occurred. And if we were to graph the mutation rate of key genes over time, we can see that generally speaking, more mutations accumulate in genes as more time passes. And you should be able to identify that there is somewhat of a linear relationship between the accumulation of mutations and the amount of time that has passed. And so we can use these trends to predict rough divergence events. For instance, if we identified approximately 60 mutations in a gene, then we use this information to suggest divergence occurred roughly 95 to 100 million years ago. Now an interesting point on this graph are the dark red data points. These relate to various primate species, and the fact that they are quite a bit below this trend line suggests that primate genes are evolving much more slowly compared to other mammals. Now the use of genes and mutations as molecular clocks to predict speciation events is not without its own problems, meaning they will never be 100% accurate. And a key problem, which is also their strength, is that the genes used for this have a set average mutation rate. But an average mutation rate is just that, an average. Mutation rates for these genes can vary above and below this average value, which may be linked to various changes in the environment. So as an example, millions of years ago the environment could have increased or decreased the mutation rate of the gene, but we are unable to predict or even account for this. Now this isn't the only issue, there are some other key problems associated with our molecular clocks. Firstly, some genes, whilst found in different species, might have different mutation rates, meaning it can be faster in some species and slower in others, which can lead to inaccuracies if this is not accounted for in our analysis and comparison of molecular clocks. Secondly, some genes can be erratic in how they accumulate mutations, meaning it is difficult to assign an average mutation rate, and again, this can lead to inaccuracies if this is not accounted for during data analysis. 
Third, some genes within the same genome can have vastly different mutation rates, so genes involved in fundamental processes will typically accumulate mutations much more slowly due to the risk of fatal mutations. And finally, molecular clocks often rely on calibration with the fossil records we have, but the fossil records itself can be incomplete or even ambiguous. The dating of fossils and their assignment to specific evolutionary lineages can sometimes be uncertain, leading to potential errors in the calibration process. Now, despite all of these challenges, molecular clocks remain a valuable tool in evolutionary biology, and our advances in genomic technologies, statistical methods, along with a better understanding of evolutionary processes, are helping to address some of these problems, improving the accuracy and reliability of molecular clock estimates. And with that, we come to the end of this video. Hopefully you found the content useful, informative, and most importantly, easy to understand. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.